So uh, welcome everybody to the uh, Scott Street Cycling Pedestrian Placemaking uh, Update public meeting. Uh, I'm Tom uh, Pakloff, I'm uh, Councillor Leaper's assistant. Um, and uh, today we're gonna learn a little bit more about the future plans for, for Scott Street uh, from essentially from Tunney's uh, into uh, past Bayview, um, but uh, also a little bit of stage two. We've got some stage two uh, folks uh, willing to, are ready to answer some questions as well, because obviously it's all connected. So how tonight is gonna work, we'll start off with some opening comments from Jeff. Um, there will be a presentation. We have transportation service staff here. Uh, Deb Lightman will be doing the presentation. Probably run about 20 minutes or so. Uh, I see there are already two uh, entries in the Q&A. Uh, and that is the spot to answer to ask your questions. After Deb is finished the presentation, we'll go through all the questions, and uh, that will uh, that will be our night. So, uh, without further ado, uh, Jeff Leaper. Thank you, Tom, and uh, good evening, everyone. I'm glad to see a good turnout for this. I know uh, lots of interest. Uh, Scott Street is a work in progress. Um, I think, uh, you know, I, I certainly have a vision for Scott Street that uh, facilitates um, excellent year-round cycling from Churchill all the way to Bayview. Uh, that is subject to budget. It's subject to a lot of different things, but I like the uh, plans that staff have showed me so far for some very near-term uh, big improvements that I like, uh, some midterm stuff, and then some aspirational stuff. Um, there are some uh, things that staff and I um, uh, sometimes we'll disagree on uh, and I will uh, continue to advocate for the best possible cycling infrastructure on Scott Street. I can't always get everything that I want uh, but I am looking forward to showing folks what staff have shown me over the past few weeks. Uh, I think it's uh, it's fairly exciting stuff. So with that I will turn it back over to Tom. Okay, thanks Jeff. And I will then uh, turn it over to Deb Lightman from Transportation Services. Thank you, Jeff and Tom. I will just, just share my screen here. And uh, did that work? Excellent. So I'm happy to be able to share some information about the projects that we have been working on along Scott Street. There are a few distinct parts to the presentation. I'll start with a review of the long-term plan for active transportation all along the Scott and Albert corridor. And uh, part of this is about creating dedicated pedestrian space and cycling space on the north side pathway. Then I'll share how we expect to implement this change in the next two years on Scott between Holland and Bayview. Part of this impl implementation also involves repurposing the bus lanes from Holland to Bayview. And so I'll go into a bit more depth of what that project looks like. And then finally, I'll give you a sense of the uh, ultimate or more aspirational design that we are advancing for this um, same part of Ho Scott from Holland to Bayview, including street trees and raised cycle tracks that we don't yet have a timeline or funding for implementation. The long-term plan for active transportation involves creating dedicated pedestrian space on the north side of Scott and Albert, where pedestrians and bikes are currently mixed on the multi-use pathway. Bikes on the north side of Scott and Albert will be in their own space and they'll be traveling in one direction only, westbound only. And eastbound bikes heading toward downtown will be riding on the south side of Scott in newly created cycle tracks or physically separated bike lanes that will be winter maintained. And the design drawing at the bottom of the uh, slide provides a sense of what the cross section looks like. Um, and that some of this information we've shared before, we've shared with the public before, but it's been a while. Um, so I'll, I'll review the, uh, the reason for this change to active transportation facilities and how we expect people to use them. The first reason is safety. At intersections, um, drivers who are turning are more likely to expect that cyclists will be traveling in the same direction as traffic. So uh, for that reason, one-way cycling in the same direction as traffic is our city standard in the urban area and it's especially important along busy arterial roads where there are high volumes of cars and also when we have lots of uh, bikes and pedestrians. 
Also related to safety at intersections, the shift to one-way cycling makes, makes, it, makes it easier to build protected intersections. And we have an image uh, showing the elements of a protected intersection. There's a corner safety island that physically protects bikes and pedestrians from turning vehicles. There's also an advanced stop bar that puts bikes and pedestrians in front of the driver's stop bar and makes them more visible. It also shortens the crossing distance, which is nice. Um, and then finally, we set back the cross ride and crosswalk so that bikes and pedestrians are more visible to turning cars and you can even get eye contact with drivers. We have a bit more information on protected intersections in our website. If, you're in, if you are interested, I encourage you to check out the information and short video there. Another benefit to making this change is that we will be able to get rid of the walk your bike signs all along the pathway and allow bikes to ride through signalized intersections uh, legally. And finally, there's the benefit of separating out pedestrians and bikes into their own spaces. It's more comfortable and convenient for all users. And there are also accessibility benefits and safety benefits. And separating out pedestrians and bikes is especially the important along busy corridors close to downtown, near O train stations where we already have lots of pedestrians bi and bikes. And we expect to have even higher volumes of pedestrians and cyclists in the future. So moving into how this will roll out along the Scott and Albert corridor. Uh, as you can see on this map, there are many projects that allow the transition to happen in different sections. So uh, about seven projects between Churchill and Bay that are planned between now and roughly 2024. All of these projects um, create that same um, configuration with pedestrians and bikes separated on the north side of the corridor, bikes riding in only one direction, um, on the north side and on the south side, and then adding the physically separated cycling facilities that make the, um, the eastbound cycling more comfortable, um, safer, easier to winter maintain. So from here on in, we'll be zooming into Scott from Churchill to Bayview, uh, because that is where we have the most immediate changes planned coming up in the next two years in 2021 and 2022. So the first phase of this changeover happens uh, in 2021 from Churchill to Holland. And this is tied to the stage two um, construction and implementation of the transit way detour along Scott. And as part of that stage two detour, we're lucky to be getting uh, quite a few protected intersections constructed um, along the stretch from Churchill to Holland. And they are designed for the westbound only cycling. And once we've built these designs, it becomes very difficult and awkward to have bikes traveling in two directions without conflicts with each other, with pedestrians. Um, we've provided kind of a little snip of the, uh, one of the design drawings, but we actually, the pedestrian part of the pathway on either side of the intersection is built as a concrete sidewalk. So it's very clearly a pedestrian space. Before we roll out this transition, there are two prerequisites that we will make sure are in place. Um, first is that the physically separated and winter maintained eastbound bike facilities will be um, present on the south side of Scott. And then secondly, the pathway will be uh, set, kind of split out using tactile delineators to create the distinct pedestrian and uh, bike space. And at the time of both of these rollouts, we will have on-site engagement um, to help users adapt to make sure everybody knows um, what the change is, what they're expected to do where, and why we're making this change. So I'll go into a bit more depth um, on what the, I guess, the three phases look like. I guess starting with existing, right now we have two-way cycling on the north side pathway, but with a whole bunch of walk your bike conditions at the intersections. And we also do have a buffered bike lane on the south side of Scott. Earlier this year, there was construction in front of Tiny's Pasture Station to, to build that to our future um, configuration. So that's the, the one-way westbound cycle track. And that create that means that uh, eastbound bikes have to have to walk that stretch for the time being. And that, that's really required because the because of the new passenger pickup and drop-off area that was um, 
built and installed right in front of the station and right next to that cycle track. And it includes uh, paratranspo also uses it. The first phase of the transition, and we expect this to be um, rolled out in the fall of 2021 after the stage two construction happens along this corridor. So we have five new protected intersections coming in at Churchill, Lanark, Island Park, Smurl, and Holland over the 2021 season. And then we also have the, um, the eastbound bike facilities being added from Churchill to Holland. Um, and then if bikes want to cross back to the, uh, the, the multi-use pathway at Holland, they'll be able to do so using the protected intersection. And in the winter, um, that multi-use pathway will stay as the winter maintained cycling route. Then the next phase um, from Holland to Bayview happens the following year and we'll be building two new protected intersections at Parkdale and Carruthers. And at the end of that um, project, we will have separated, physically separated cycling on the south side of Scott, all the way from Churchill to Bayview. That will become the winter maintained route. Um, uh, Deb, if I could just interject here, I think in the center drawing phase one, the orange dot clusters need to actually be shifted up. So uh, it's not to imply that if you're cycling eastbound, you have to walk your bike, you don't on the road. So the intention is those orange dots should be on the, uh, the muck portion. Thanks for catching that, Zlatko. <laughs> Great addition. Um, last minute power, PowerPoint formatting errors, but, but it's exactly as Zlatko said, that um, we keep all the walk your bikes that are there today on that pathway but the, um, the on-street south side facility um, stays as it is as well. And then I guess the next, um, the next thing we wanted to share is just that the, in terms of what these eastbound bike facilities will look like after the 2021 and 2022 um, implementation, it, it is a mix of raised cycle tracks and um, physically separated pin curb uh, cycling facilities. And then another, another nice um, kind of benefit of the stage two construction happening next year is that uh, we will actually be building a new sidewalk from Tweedsmuir to McRae. We understand that this is a, uh, a big win because um, winter walking in that area has not been uh, pleasant so far. So that'll, uh, that'll be a kind of great value added. Um, the next thing we wanted to go into is a bit more of what the 2022 project uh, will, will entail with the repurposing of bus lanes from Holland to Bayview, and we know this has been um, eagerly anticipated. <laughs> so the, the kind of the big, uh, the big takeaway, the reducing vehicle lanes from Holland to Bayview. Um, we'll also be building those protected intersections at Parkdale and Carruthers. And the way vehicle lanes will be reduced um, is through a mixture of pin curbs and concrete barrier islands uh, to create a street level separated eastbound bike facility. Um, the example on the screen is a similar type of facility implemented along MacArthur. Uh, the, the, the image on the right shows how, how that is built and then the image on the left is uh, the, an example of a protected intersection. So quite a, quite a significant construction involved in that protected intersection. And um, the, the pinned curb bike lane and reduced vehicle lanes, we're calling more of an, uh, kind of an interim reconfiguration because we don't have the funding to rebuild the whole corridor. At the same time, um, separating out the pedestrians and bikes on the north side pathway with tactile delineators, again, required for that transition. Uh, so looking at the lane reductions, going down to four lanes in the area around Holland and Parkdale, down to three lanes around Carruthers, and then going from all the way down to two lanes in the stretch between Carruthers and Bayview. Uh, 
uh, and that includes includes turn lanes. So that's the total um, future roadway width. Another aspect of the project is a short but valuable contraflow bike lane on Carruthers between Ladusser and Scott. And this is something that was proposed in the Armstrong uh, study community vision 2017. It's helpful to increase uh, the value of that protected intersection we're putting in and also to add north-south connectivity. It's the first street uh, west of Bayview where you can cross over from uh, the south to the north um, and it's a nice alternative to crossing at Parkdale which, which won't have um, fully separated facilities uh, in the foreseeable future. What this means um, for that block, the parking and loading would shift to the west side of Carruthers. We, under, we know that there is a community proposal to prohibit winter parking and the contraflow bike lane will not have an impact on that. That can still proceed. And again, this is in 2022. And an example of what this might look like, uh, this is the image on the slide is Homewood um, from Bank to O'Connor where it's a fairly narrow street with a contraflow bike lane and parking and it operates uh, very well from what we've seen so far. Uh, final component of this uh, 2022 project is that we do end up with some additional space on uh, the south side after implementing the separated bike facility and the width varies by location but um, where we go down from four lanes to two lanes is where we have the most extra space in the right of way. Oh, and we're working with our colleagues in the public realm and uh, urban design branch at the city to um, see how we can create space for public realm improvements. So this, this might be things like community maintained planters or simply providing flexible space uh, for community programming by community partners. Uh, perhaps, perhaps parking bays in strategic locations as well. We don't have identified city funding at this time, um, but perhaps future development may create opportunities to do a little bit more with the space if we haven't uh, made further changes to the corridor by that time. And um, if, if there are community partners or people with connections um, to these organizations on this call, uh, we would invite you to start thinking about what you might want to do with this space and reach out to Mark Young at the City of Ottawa. Uh, his email is on the slide. The final thing we wanted to share is our design for a more extensive rebuild of Scott pending future funding. So with the uh, ultimate design, the idea is that we would keep the lane reductions that were implemented in 2022, but rebuild the south curb to be able to add wider sidewalks, raise cycle tracks, and a treed boulevard. We understand that greening Scott and adding canopy trees is a top priority. Maintaining reliable local bus, bus service is also something we would hope to achieve and we understand that parking is not a community priority. So adding canopy trees, building comfortable pedestrian and bike facilities, and uh, maintaining reliable local bus service are sort of the parameters for the design. Here we have the same map of the lane configurations but also showing the sample cross sections uh, from the working version of the ultimate design once we are able to rebuild that south curb. Uh, so nice amounts of space for uh, large trees along the corridor. That is the end of the material that we wanted to share with you. I'll hand it back to Tom now to uh, see if there's any questions. Okay, thank you, Deb. We do have some questions. And uh, so we'll start at the top. It seems like a good place to start. Um, Arnold uh, Toporowski, uh, question about the intersection of Scott and Island Park. Uh, needs a right turn lane on Scott headed west. Long standing problem at that intersection on workday evenings. Long lineups to turn right lead to people using the left turn to move straight through, and that's an unexpected behavior. It can be dangerous to pedestrians, cyclists, motorists alike. Can we plan on making a right turn lane on Scott Heading West at Island Park? Maybe once the train line is complete, 
and buses are off of Scott. So, Councillor, uh, do you maybe want me to take that one from a stage two perspective? I believe so, yes. Campbell Inwood from stage two. So, hi everyone, my name is Campbell Inwood. I'm the program manager for traffic management with stage two. And um, I can confirm that with the modifications to the roadway that we will be making in order to make the, the bus detour uh, function as effectively as we need it to, uh, while the train is still being constructed, we will be adding a westbound right turn lane at the intersection of Scott and Island Park. So that uh, we would expect that to be complete towards the fall of 2021, as Deb alluded to previously, although I will, of course, uh, put in the standard disclaimer that we don't control the contractor's construction times. Uh, so there's a chance that that could bleed into 2022, but um, we do know that the bus detour itself will start in 2022, and this is a key component. We won't put the buses on detour until this is constructed, and so it's a feature of that construction. And uh, so it's coming. Thank you, Campbell. Um, our next three questions come from Dave Robertson. First one, much of the eastbound cycle track in the plan seems to be 1.5 meters width. Transportation Association of Canada suggests 2.1 meters per direction for cycle track. Can we meet these standards? I can speak to that. Okay. We do have a yeah. mix of, uh, of widths for that eastbound cycle track. Um, the target is always 1.8 to 2 meters. Um, so, and in the section from um, Bayview to Holland, where we do have a lot of space, absolutely, we will be at 2 meters. Um, in certain sections of the corridor uh, between Churchill and Holland, there are constraints that require um, narrowing down to generally 1.8. Um, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm trying to recall where we showed 1.5 meters in width, but that's a fairly rare occurrence, just over short and very constrained sections. And we can consider it the absolute minimum that we try to avoid whenever possible. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dave's next question, will we be eliminating concrete curbs between cycling facilities and streets to uh, ensure, uh, just hang on, to ensure a smooth and comfortable experience. Um, I can uh, address that. Thank you, Zaku. I think what um, is being asked is that when you transition from, for example, a roadway onto an in a protected intersection, you often have a bit of a concrete curb, which is supposed to be smooth but over time often uh, becomes a, a bump, if you will. So we are looking increasingly at eliminating those transitions. And so uh, we'll take that away and look within the current design to see where that, uh, that improvement could be uh, considered. Okay, thank you. And then the last question, um, I mean, I'll open it up to anyone who wants to comment, but I think it might be something that Dave just needs to take offline with me. Uh, great to hear eastbound cycle track will be winter maintained. The city struggled with maintaining on-street bike lanes on the winter cycling network. Any solutions for this? I think this is probably on a street by street basis, depending on the circumstances. Um, and uh, if you can give me more specific, drop me an email and give me more specific locations and we can talk about it street by street, but happy to open it up to anyone else wants to come in. Yeah, I could uh, comment, uh, Tom. Sure. Uh, my, our experience on the Laurier bike lanes has been uh, very positive in terms of the level of, um, of uh, service that uh, is being received in the bike lane. And that's because in that sort of a um, pin curve protected bike lane, there's a, a separate snow machine that goes down there. Now on some of the other roads on the winter cycling network, uh, there's basically just essentially a painted uh, bike facility and there isn't always a separate machine but I believe in Scott Street eastbound uh, the former case will apply so I think our, our expectation and hope would be for uh, a fairly uh, high quality of winter maintenance. Okay, excellent, thank you. Next one is more of a suggestion, it comes from Aaron McBride. A guy on Scott likes to garden. He makes a beautiful garden next to the MUP uh, for the programming space. If someone knows him, he'd be a good option. Um, 
if someone does know, happy to happy to uh, look into that further. But uh, we'll we'll take it from there. Um, uh, next, Ben Laserson uh, asks about the Carruthers Contra Lane. Uh, any considerations uh, on, on why it hasn't been extended all the way through to Wellington? I can speak to that. The um, width of the road reduces, gets it gets quite a lot narrower as you get closer to Wellington. And so uh, south of La Douceur, it would require um, restricting or removing on street parking. And so um, that's certainly something we could look at, but in our experience, it's a bit more of a um, kind of uh, involved process if we are removing on street parking that um, people who live on that street do use and value. And certainly we, we are open to the idea and um, would, would explore it going further. There's nothing to say that we can't extend it, um, but the initial kind of easy implementation as a, as a bonus to the project is for that um, lock for this to the north. And uh, it does allow, there is kind of a way through the various streets uh, that provides a relatively direct connection to Scott. If you just have that last block, that missing link closed. Okay, thanks Deb. This ties in with what uh, Aaron had been suggesting earlier from Loretta Fleming. Would you consider community gardens along Scott Street in all areas, especially in the reduced lane areas. I can speak to that if you'd like, Tom. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's a very interesting suggestion and definitely something we will take under advisement. Um, we're looking for a variety of ideas in terms of programming and anything to um, work with a community partner to get something going that's green and uh, will enhance the space and ensure that the space is utilized. So especially as we work our way east, we find there's more room. There's probably going to be up to seven meters. So it's definitely um, something for consideration. And hopefully as we work through, we'll be able to consult the community a bit further next year um, as it relates to what uh, other ideas come up for that space. Thanks, Mark. That's Mark Young from Public Realm. Uh, okay, so from uh, Paulette Dozois, uh, uh, years ago we were promised a bike lane along Armstrong. I'm wondering if this is an opportunity in 2022 to get that started along Armstrong, which could hook onto Scott along Hinchy, which is wider, or Carruthers. Uh, Deb or Zlatko? It says Latko here. I, 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 well, first of all, this is not part of this current project scope. Uh, however, we are updating our active transportation plan, uh, part of which is the cycling network. And so uh, that's a good time to talk about what projects uh, might be needed in the future. Excellent. Thank you. Um, from Dave Robertson. Any plans for additional safety measures for larger intersections like centerline hardening to slow cars down? I can start. Um, sure. We are definitely interested in slowing down cars at intersections and uh, we use a variety of ways to do that. One of the main ways we try to do that is by tightening up the curb radius. And so that is something that we do look to do um, at our protected intersections and at all intersections, we are rebuilding um, center line hardening. Uh, there are a couple of places, I believe at Holland, um, there is a, a median on one of the legs, but one of the challenges with those is that sometimes there's a trade off between, um, as you tighten up the curb radius, you have to allow for some over tracking of the occasional large truck onto the opposite side of the street. And so um, the fender line hardening doesn't work well with um, that approach. And so usually our, our go to, usually we focus on curb radii um, as our primary measure as we rebuild intersections. Slacko, anything to add? I would also say that as we reduce the number of lanes, 
that we would expect um, the um, speeding that sometimes occurs in, in um, lower traffic conditions to be reduced. Okay, thank you. Our next question uh, from Jill Duruk. Will city staff apply a max parking ratio per unit to large developments along Scotland Street to reduce car use and increase use of public transit maximum of 0.7, for example, all for not adding on-street parking and improved pedestrian experience? I feel like this might be more for Jeff. Yeah, I'm not sure we have anyone from the, um, the, the planning department here. We, we don't, uh, no. No, so for each of those Scott Street developments, I'm pushing for uh, for a 0.5. Actually, uh, the ratio has been coming in around 0.7, but uh, that's not by policy at this point. Uh, the city has eliminated minimum parking requirements for residential parking, uh, and and we see more developments that are taking advantage of that. Um, I think that this is something that you'd probably want to raise through the transportation master plan um, as we seek to get a more aggressive modal share for cycling and active and transit compared to private auto, um, the, you know, uh, uh, maximum parking ratios uh, becomes one of the uh, one of the important nudges to that. Uh, so at a policy level, I would certainly encourage you to input that into the transportation master plan uh, consultations and, and discussion over the next uh, couple of years. In the meantime, I will continue pushing every developer for a 0.5, if not less. I would also just add that the official plan is uh, the draft official plan speaks to parking as well and it's now out for consultation. Okay, thank you. Uh, Cheryl Parrott, very happy to see two lanes. Question at the moment, cycling lane holds all the snow from the road and sidewalk. Uh, important that the snow from the road and the cycling lane does not end up on the sidewalk because sidewalk's been used. So where will the snow go? We don't have anyone from road services here, but I can certainly take that back to them. And if anyone else has a comment. Um, and I will add that yeah. where we can, we, we build a boulevard area that allows okay. for snow storage. And again, it won't be a problem at all between um, Holland and Bayview to provide that space where we do have the um, kind of the, the extra space in the, in the roadway. Um, it is sometimes a bit more tricky where uh, everything is very constrained and their uh, road services uh, tries to find solutions. Yeah, at the, at the corner of Bayview Station and Scott, um, that is, is often uh, absolutely full with snow when the plows go by. Um, and, you know, they're keeping Scott really well plowed uh, because of the, the transit priority that they have. Uh, but it often means uh, some serious problems for accessibility for pedestrians down in that end. So um, I, I can only imagine, though, that the uh, when we have that additional space and, and boulevards, uh, that that's going to be vastly improved, I would hope, anyways. Okay. From Close Belsner, the new high rise on Scott between McRae and Clifton has recessed parking spaces. How will the cycle track work in this segment? Can we possibly come back to this question? I'm just pulling up the design and I'm quite confident that in the ultimate configuration, the um, cycle track goes adjacent between the sidewalk and the parking bays. I'm just um, checking the way it looks at the moment in the, um, the detour condition. Absolutely, I've made a note. We will come back to that. Um, and uh, Linda Brown, if it hasn't been asked yet, I don't believe it has, what safety features will be uh, there to ensure high volume pedestrian traffic at Holland and Scott or other intersections connecting to LRT? I think this ties into the protected intersection, but. Is there any further comments? Slacko or Deb? Uh, can you repeat that one, please? Yeah, it's just if, uh, what safety features will there be um, for, for the high uh, pedestrian volume? Uh, that we'll see at Holland and Scott or other intersections connecting to the LRT, like Bayview, for instance, as well. Good to add to that. 
Well, the protected intersections, they, they offer additional safety for yep. pedestrians as well because the corner area is, uh, has an actual curb. So it really encourages traffic to avoid, uh, you know, cutting the corner, if you will. There'll also be separate waiting areas for cyclists and pedestrians. And I think uh, having used this corridor for many, many years myself, as a cyclist primarily, I think it's always been um, challenging and will continue to be even more challenging to mix uh, cyclist and pedestrian usage on that multi-use pathway. And so through this process, we're gonna give the pedestrians their own space. And I think that will be appreciated as well. Okay, thank you, Zlatko. I think we, uh, I think we uh, touched on Island Park and Scott uh, already. Um, but here's a question from Elaine McGregor. If, if this is supposed to be a major east-west cycling corridor, how are you allowing for increased usage? So I guess uh, the question is, is there room to expand it if, if need be, expand space? I, I would say that the first step um, is to deal with separating bikes and pedestrians on the north side, which effectively gives more space for cyclists because they uh, are no longer uh, sharing it with pedestrians. And in the longer term, as we uh, reconfigure the roadway, we do have a fair bit of space except for a few constrained locations. So the bike tracks will be built you know, to the two meter standard wherever possible, which should be a fair part of the corridor. And that include the, in addition to buffers, so that should provide uh, enough room for cyclists to pass, which is uh, important if the corridor is heavily used and is uh, long. Um, if I may, uh, I'm just going to give Elaine. I, I, I'm just going to give Elaine uh, some some talking privileges for a sec, just to um, make sure that that answered the question. Um, Elaine, if you want to uh, talk. Um, so you have the ability now to use your voice. Um, did that answer the question? That was generally what I was trying to find out was whether we did we would be able to expand the uh, this because clearly Laurier has already or it's already overused at, at peak hours and there are other places that are overused and if you're going to have this as a uh, useful uh, cycling area, it has to be able to be expanded. Perfect. Thanks. Okay, uh, moving on, uh, Louise Atkins, not related to this specifically, but during LRT phase two construction, when buses on Scott Street arrive at Churchill, what is the bus route back down to the transit way at Dominion Station? Perhaps one for Campbell. Uh, yes, indeed. So um, as part of creating a, a separate transit way, for buses when we're out of the transit way trench, we will be extending Scott Street um, effectively along the south side of the transit way trench where it will operate as a bus only road. Um, and then that will cross to the north side of the transit way trench um, at where Roosevelt's uh, is. There's a pedestrian bridge now that will be removed and refurbished during the time that we're uh, using this for. A transit way detour and it will carry then along the north side of the trench um, in, until the trench rises to grade at Dominion Station and there will be some temporary platforms at Dominion Station. So effectively it's an extension of Scott Street that will be used for buses only west of Churchill connecting to the Sir John McDonald Parkway. Okay. Thank you Campbell. Next question from uh, John, Jonathan uh, Bourgeois. Wasn't clear to me from the drawings uh, when the cycle track will go in between Ross Avenue and Smurl Avenue. Will that section be completed in fall 2021? If so, when does the work begin? When will affected neighbors get specifics regarding things such as loss of driveways and trees, etc.? That's a good question. Slack or Deb? 
I think yeah. that as uh, construction uh, starts to ramp up, we have um, on-site managers, and I think there'll be consultation as needed in terms of any uh, disruptions, potential disruptions. I think uh, we go to great length to make sure people can still get access to properties. Um, if I may, I think, uh, sorry, I'm just pulling the question back up again. Uh, between Ross and Smurl. So right now the cycle track ends at uh, Ross. Yes. And so I haven't seen a design for that section of cycle track. And I think that's probably what Jonathan is interested in seeing is what will that look like and what would be the impacts to the, um, uh, you know, to the property. It is part of the stage two construction that's happening over the 2021 season. So yes, um, for completion roughly in fall 2021. And it, the cycle track gets added between the existing sidewalk and the curb. So it, it is a raised cycle track, but within the existing boulevard yep. without, without much impact on the sidewalk. It's between, sorry, it's between the sidewalk and the curb? Yes. Okay, great. But um, yeah, I, I will still on uh, Jonathan's um, behalf, I, I'd like to see a design on that sooner rather than later. We can share that, definitely. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, next up from Daniel, um, do we know when the approved sidewalks and raised cycle tracks will be completed where the existing water main work is in progress? And I believe uh, that is, if I'm not mistaken, now in the spring. That is my understanding as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, there, the, the, uh, the, the water main project originally had a hard uh, end in December but have learned that uh, the LRT project does not need uh, Scott Street as quite as early as they thought. So that gives a little bit more uh, leeway for the uh, Scott Street project. And I believe um, the benefits there is the quality work um, can be better uh, if it's not done in the winter and the cold temperatures. And the, so that, that will probably be a, a benefit long term. Uh, next question from Neil. How do you address congestion on eastbound Scott as morning rush hour traffic headed downtown is constricted from five lanes down to two over the course of 10 city blocks? There's already large congestion on Island Park Drive during both rush hours. Aren't you just inviting more neighborhood traffic infiltration? Why not keep traffic moving on Scott as it was before? As part of determining lane configurations, we do do um, modeling in synchro and we do have targets for um, the vehicle level of service um, in the in a given geographic area. And so um, for that relatively short stretch, um, the two lane configuration does meet our vehicle level of service targets and allows for um, reasonable traffic flow based on our, our models of current and future demand. Okay, thanks, Deb. From Diane, will any of the intersections be revert to red signals? Those are dangerous. That so, would be uh, sorry, Deb. Um, I, I was going to offer uh, that there's nobody, I think, from our traffic operations group on this phone call, and so they're the ones who, who would be able to confirm that. However, from my experience, uh, this is not a, this is a corridor where we often have um, automated pedestrian signals. During the LRT uh, bus detour, we may need to run some of those signals um, with actuation so that they remain green if there's no demand to cross Scott Street on foot or um, in, in the car, but uh, understanding the, the issues with uh, red revert signals, we would certainly look at that and, and uh, make suggestions to our traffic operations group accordingly, but that, that's not a promise that I think anybody on this call can make. Fair enough. From Joe, uh, Joe LeMay, from a planning perspective, does the overhaul 
of the bike lanes and sidewalks along Scott Street influence your view on commercial uses in this corridor? Is the goal to concentrate commercial uses along Richmond Wellington, or would you encourage developers to continue to add ground floor commercial uses on new projects? That's Jeff, Again, I think. Yeah, there's. Uh, it's a it's a good question, Joe. So from the beginning of, uh, I want to say, um, you know, even through the the CDP processes, uh, there has been a vision for Scott Street of accommodating uh, commercial use, um, but we haven't required it. And so most of the buildings that are going in have largely been entirely residential without a lot of commercial. Uh, there are a couple of the buildings up near uh, Churchill, though, where they are looking at putting commercial at grade. Personally, I think with the, um, uh, the inclusion of cycle tracks and better sidewalks uh, and cycling lanes uh, where, where we haven't got the cycle tracks yet. Um, that probably does make it more attractive for some of those retailers, but it's still never going to be Richmond and Wellington that have that really tight knit urban fabric to them. There's still a lot of separation between the floor plates of the different towers. Um, so that's, I'm sorry, that's a lot of words to say maybe. Um, uh, certainly whenever a developer is approaching my office, um, I'm, I'm encouraging them to consider retail at grade. Um, the Tunney's Pasture redevelopment is also going to spur a lot more potential to have successful commercial on uh, Scott Street. When you have that population base that is living right across the street, uh, but so far the developers don't seem to, um, uh, they're not looking forward that far, just given the uncertainty of the Tunney's pasture timing in terms of uh, trying to make it a, a denser commercial strip. Okay, thanks Jeff. Uh, Elaine McGregor uh, says the separation of peds and cyclists and unidirectional bike facilities is good. Are you really going to ensure peds are not endangered by speeding cyclists westbound? Yeah, <clears throat> Elaine, it says LACCO responding. I think there'll be a number of things that we're going to do to try to uh, make it as safe as possible. First of all, the uh, multi-use pathway, the asphalt will have tactile strips put in the middle. Those are 0 0.2 meters wide and they have a fairly, you've probably seen them around, they have a fairly big indentation on them. Uh, we'll put markings, pavement markings to indicate a, a pedestrian area as well as uh, a cycling area with an arrow to indicate direction. Uh, we will also um, when the facility opens, we're going to spend some time on outreach to uh, get out there, talk to people, put up extra signs just to make sure people understand that there's a change in behaviors that's expected. And so uh, overall, uh, the uh, uh, configuration of having cyclists uh, beside pedestrians separated by these tactile strips is going to be fairly common. So, um, uh, there's no 100% solution, but those are the elements that we're going to bring into play to, to try to address that concern. Thanks, Michael. So we heard about uh, uh, turn lanes from Island or from Scott onto Island Park, but Sherry is wondering about turn lanes off Island Park onto Scott uh, for both north and southbound traffic, including advanced extended traffic lights. So I imagine that's uh, one for, for me, Tom. Okay, sure, yeah. And, uh, if you can buy me about 10 seconds, I can get the drawing in front of my face and confirm that. I just don't want to misspeak here. You know what, um, I've just seen Diane's question has been sitting at the top for a little bit with respect to, while uh, Campbell's looking for that, will any of the intersections be revert to red signals? Those are dangerous. I thought we addressed that one. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, you probably did. <laughs> okay. That's okay, Councillor. You bought me all the time I needed. So. <laughs> See, it all worked out. <laughs> so um, I can confirm that uh, we are showing a southbound left turn lane on Island Park. We've got left turn lanes from eastbound and westbound Scott onto Island Park. Um, but in the northbound direction, there are no auxiliary turn lanes 
as, as part of the design. And again, that would have been uh, done after having looked at what was required to meet the city's level of service standards. Okay, thanks, Campbell. Uh, from Loretta Fleming, how will the construction of multiple towers be managed with the construction of Scott Street? I think that's probably Campbell too. Well, um, so we, we in, in the LRT office, and as we do the construction uh, associated with the building these, these intersections for the detour, we're coordinating quite directly with the developers that are building along Scott Street. Um, we have been imposing strict restrictions um, on them to basically give priority to the uh, construction that we need to do to make sure that the bus detour works. So um, uh, effectively, th there's a different answer in every case, but we are attuned to the issue and meeting regularly with uh, the development review teams to ensure that good traffic management is, is achieved. Thank you, Campbell. Uh, from Matt Whitehead, has there been any consideration for the planned Parkdale intersection for future cycling connections uh, uh, going south on Parkdale or, or to the MUP at the river? We are um, looking at adding bike lanes on Parkdale north of Scott. Um, we didn't specifically kind of focus on that because uh, we haven't determined how far they can go. Um, south of Parkdale, uh, it looks like we will be able to kind of tie in the intersection um, to the south to, a, to kind of providing basically a, a short bike lane that then merges into traffic, but unfortunately, there is not space to go very far on Parkdale uh, to the south. So basically we'll take it as far as we can within the existing curb to curb and with the other, um, it, it is um, a fairly constrained corridor. Okay, thanks, Seth. From uh, Christine Dave and uh, David Welch, uh, please give an overview of the changes to the Albert Street Bridge over the O-Train, currently a treacherous pinch point for cyclists. What changes, how long, etc. There are actually uh, two rounds of changes. So in the next two years, the bus lanes will also be um, removed from the Albert Street Bridge and then we get, we get on-street bike lanes um, over the bridge. And then uh, a bit further down the road, once the bridge gets a uh, a rehabilitation, we're able to add raised cycle tracks. Okay. Um, and from Neil, why is there a need for programming areas? There appears to be at least 10 parks with an easy access of the corridor. Taking away an east-west arterial road for a few people in the community seems counterintuitive. I'm all for beautification of the area, but it also must be functional. I think Debbie addressed this before that it, it met the, the requirements and the targets. Yes, I think that's that's the same yeah. Uh, yeah. same okay. point and understood. Yeah. We, we hear you there. And I was on mute. Okay, from Dave Robertson, cross section of eastbound cycle track looks to be downslope of sidewalk with a 2% grade. Are we concerned about drainage or icing on the cycle track during freeze thaws? I think we'll have to uh, take that away and see if there's any comments from uh, Public Works. Uh, I, I think we, we will follow our standards to the extent uh, possible in terms of cross slope. Although I do appreciate, uh, especially in the eastbound cycle track, it's going to be in the shade a lot. So, um, you know, there may be extra uh, attention paid when we uh, salt that area. Uh, but I don't think we can give a much better answer right now. Okay, thanks, Lacko. 
Um, from Loretta Fleming, where can we access the PowerPoint and the proposals online for a more focused review? Uh, I believe we will put that up on our blog uh, tomorrow. And uh, on the city website as well, Deb or Zaka? We, we are planning to uh, create a city web page dedicated to this corridor and we'll uh, try to get this information online as soon as possible. Um, definitely in the next uh, month and um, hope and be, we'll, we'll be adding kind of designs and further details as they become available in that same location. But will, will I have this PowerPoint presentation tomorrow then? I can share the, yes, I can share the slide deck tomorrow. Yep. We just have to go through kind of translation and making things accessible to be able to add them to the city website. So it's sure. a bit of a longer okay. process. Yeah, so once I have this deck, um, I'll put it on my blog and I will share that uh, through the newsletter. Okay. And also if anyone wants to uh, send an email to Deb, Deb, maybe you can include it on the chat if it, or we'll add it to the slides as well. Uh, if there are any specific questions, that's also another way to address them. Perfect. Okay, uh, from Elaine McGregor, my experience of protected intersections is that they are a disaster. Fisher Dines, for example, they increase dangers to cyclists because it's harder for motorists to see cyclists when they move out of the line of traffic and force cyclists to yield to other traffic at least twice per intersection. They make cyclists second-class citizens compared to ordinary intersections. If they raise cyclists, uh, they also increase the danger of falls. Strongly object to these as part of this project. So that's more of a comment than a question. Well, I, I, Elaine, uh, it's, uh, it's definitely uh, considered best practice and primarily because the crossing point uh, offers uh, turning vehicles and cyclists a 90 degree um, angle so that become much more visible. So we are uh, you know, relying on the uh, quite significant amount of research that's been done that uh, shows that this is a, a safer way to manage intersections. From uh, Ben Lazerson, assume it's out of scope, but curious how new cycle track transitions to MUP or on-street lanes east of Bayview. Uh, current alignment is challenging at Scott Bayview intersection given some blind conditions of turning gear. Maybe I'll say that we are looking at this intersection and uh, we'll hope to um, share the design for, for how it will how the uh, transitions will happen um, in a few months. I'll just add, uh, Ben, I totally agree with you and I, I haven't seen a solution to that yet, but this is a priority for me, especially if you are uh, coming from the multi-use path that is on the north side of the transit uh, and then trying to get on to having to cross Bayview Station Road, make the jog under the LRT and then continue on your way. Uh, that is, I haven't seen a satisfactory solution to that one yet, but it is a priority for me as well. Great, thanks. Okay, from the uh, Wellington West BIA, very disappointed to see the designers abandoned the idea of creating a fully bi-directional north side multi-use path. North side will continue to be used by west and eastbound cyclists, particularly families with small children, as it has always been. Proper north side bike route requires fewer crossings, more space, much safer, easier to winter maintain with adequate space for all users. So more of a comment and a question there. Aaron McBride, are there plans at Bayview Scott to better connect to the Bayview Station section of the of the uh, multi-use path with Scott? I think the um, the earlier comment applies here. Is as we get uh, that yeah. intersection design together, then we'll share it, and we hope to improve those conditions. They are certainly um, uh, understood and visible to to us. All right. Thanks, uh, Heather Pearl. Asking if we can have a copy of the presentation for the uh, Champlain Park Community Association website. Of course. 
we will send that to you when we get it as well. Uh, <laughs> from the Wellington West BAA, I uh, commented that it's actually Dennis speaking personally as a resident rather than a uh, Wellington West Business Group area representative or executive director. Okay. Um, Mark B asks, um, is there not a concern that adding a tree line between the cycle track and the roadway will further shield cyclists from motorist view? I already find that motorists do not always notice and anticipate cyclists when they do not share the roadway with them, ironically, even at protected intersections like Prince of Wales and Pines. And uh, we have talked through this question and the advantage and disadvantages of having the cycle track adjacent to the curb versus adjacent to the sidewalk. Um, the if um, when we when we put the cycle track next to the sidewalk with trees uh, between the cyclists and the cars, um, we would always make sure that sight lines approaching the intersection, the, the line of trees would stop um, far enough ahead of the intersection that there'd be uh, good sight lines and uh, that awareness of, of bikes and pedestrians would still be achieved. Um, we, we have looked at research from other places that shows um, bikes and pedestrians having the preference of being further away from traffic um, and next to the trees. And in this condition, in this situation, there's also, it creates more space for trees. So there's some places in the corridor where you, where you can only fit a large canopy tree if you take this configuration. But it's, it's a good point. And so yes, definitely um, sight lines are a priority for those safe crossings. Okay, thanks, Deb. From Jen Stelter, are there any improvements to lighting for the westbound track in the plan? It can be quite dark in some areas. Uh, Jen, it's Latko here. Uh, no, there are no specific plans at this point that I'm aware of. However, if you don't mind following up with specific locations that you think are problematic, we could ask uh, street lighting to perhaps do a check of the lighting levels and uh, it's possible they could come up with some suggestions on, on those areas. Okay, thank you. From Janet, and I think uh, this one is to Mark Young, would you also consider public art in the public space along Scott in the reduced lane areas? Mark. Uh, thanks for the question, Janet. I think it's certainly a consideration. Um, and we'll reach out to our colleagues in public art to, to let them know that there's an opportunity. Um, so I'd, I appreciate the idea and uh, we'll have to have a better understanding of what space we're left with and look at the context and make sure that it's context appropriate, but it's definitely a, a possibility. All right. And uh, while we have uh, Mark here, Heather Mitchell's asking, will the section between Tunnies and Churchill have the public realm spaces? Uh, for public realm, could we consider public art there as well? Yep, definitely, definitely a okay. consideration we can Perfect. discuss uh, in the new year. Absolutely, great. Uh, so just add on the oh. on the limits, it would be um, Holland to Park. Holland is the um, the westernmost um, extent of where we have that that space. Holland to Bayview. Okay, okay. Uh, and now. Uh, Dennis speaking for the Wellington West BIA uh, and is very interested in speaking about the projects uh, to creatively reclaim pavement space now that the uh, BIA boundaries have been expanded. So we'll take that uh, into consideration for sure. Dave Robertson asks, are there planned PXOs outside of the protected intersections along Scott? So, Deb, I don't know, maybe if you want to speak uh, to the section east of Holland, but, but I can offer that uh, for the section west of Holland, uh, we have no plans to add any PXOs to Scott Street of, you know, during the course of the, the transitway detour that will have to be operating there. Um, and, and so future uh, projects, of course, are, are not precluded, but nothing between Churchill and uh, Holland while the detour is operating. There also are not any planned from Holland to Bayview. I just want to add to that from other conversations across the ward, PXOs on, um, you know, Scott will still be a, a high volume street and, uh, you know, the speeds will still be 
you know, hopefully they'll be reduced, but they'll still be on the high end. And uh, I know that uh, PXOs are not always um, recommended there because, you know, the unfortunate reality is even if you press the button and the lights are flashing, um, it's 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 a wide, it's, it's a long distance to cross and there's no real guarantee that uh, the drivers will stop. I know that uh, our inbox is, you know, filled regularly with complaints about, uh, you know, PXOs where drivers don't stop. So um, it, it, the, the wider the, the road is, the, you know, the more dangerous that could potentially be. Uh, from Dieter, will there be a sidewalk between Athlone and Cuisinier in front of Adams moving? So I've been uh, looking at our drawings in the background here. Um, currently, I'm not seeing any changes planned with the stage two project to the space between Athlone and Tweedsmere. Um, I know we are adding a sidewalk, I think, between McRae and Tweedsmere, but um, to the best of my understanding right now, there's... Uh, you know the a, a property line restriction and of course adam's moving has a number of driveway spaces um so we we can follow up to, to double check i'm not misleading anyone here but i um am fairly confident there's no change planned to that one block okay thanks campbell um janet asks what will the speed limit for scott be is there consideration to reducing Again, I, I can speak to uh, the section between Churchill and Holland, where the speed limit is proposed to remain unchanged at 50 kilometers an hour for the duration of the transway detour. And there's been no discussion of changing the speed limit in the other section as well. Uh, and I think there's a you know, it is a um, arterial collector road, and so um, I think that 50 kilometers an hour would be most likely where it will remain. Thanks, Laco. This next one I'm sure is outside the scope of what we're talking about here tonight, but um, with the TMP being updated, cycling plan being updated, are there any plans, Diane wants to know, uh, to improve Churchill between Scott and Ravenhill? where the complete street starts on Churchill. That could be considered as a candidate. We haven't gone through the candidate projects in um, the cycling plan portion of the active transportation update. But in addition, uh, we're broadly speaking, looking for a better way to get cyclists through that part of Westboro. Um, and not just uh, north-south along Churchill. And uh, so uh, definitely that's on our, uh, on our radar for the next uh, update of the plan. It's a, it's a big gap right now. Yeah, yeah. Ultimate design clearly labeled as being contingent on funding dollars materializing. What happens to the roadway if no such funds actually do materialize? I think it would remain in the uh, in the state that uh, we leave it after there are interim changes. Uh, in other locations, what we found is that once you've sort of sketched out where you're heading in the long term, there may be opportunities as development um, occurs to improve um, the um, the frontage in front of new developments that's compatible with the ultimate design. I think a good example of that is we've been going through that process on uh, on Beechwood Avenue, for example. Okay. Um, Cheryl Perrell, Cheryl Parrott rather, is asking: Will wider sidewalks be put in Crothers to Bayview? In the uh, in the ultimate cross sections, yes. As the um, kind of the available space uh, expands. The sidewalk, uh, I think we have in our in our current cross sections, it, it goes up to three meters um, between Carruthers and Bayview. But I, we generally tried to make sure we got our canopy tree in first, 
and then widen the sidewalk um, after that. Okay, Loretta Fleming wondering what barriers we put in place in front of the uh, social housing complex to provide protection from noise and fumes from 250 buses during rush hour. I believe she's speaking about the Tega building. We've had a number of presentations with the residents there. Um, and I'll, uh, I'll throw this over to Campbell for, for further comment. Thanks, Tom. Um, the design, I believe, currently calls for a jersey barrier wall and a chain link fence on top of that wall to provide um, safe protection to, um, you know, residents from that building who, you know, we, we want to keep people off the bus only roadway is effectively the case. And there's going to be a uh, pathway provided alongside that for these residents. With regard to noise, not my area of expertise, but my recollection is that studies determined that the noise wall, given the location of the road, would have to be impractically high to have any tangible positive effect. Yeah, we've had that discussion with the residents uh, a couple of times. There is, you know, the potential to put a um, uh, a bit of a noise barrier in there, but it won't actually prevent noise from reaching most of the building, but would um, create a uh, a less safe or or more confined feeling along that path. So uh, we're not moving forward with uh, with a noise wall on that side. Uh Question from Neil, probably more for our signals team, which uh, are not on this call, but would, he's wondering, wouldn't it make sense to set traffic lights as flashing red lights after eight o'clock, for, for instance, at night, uh, when traffic monitoring data shows lighter traffic uh, during the later evening hours and overnight, wouldn't it be beneficial running the traffic lights at stop signs after 8 p.m.? Yeah, Tom, I, I agree that uh, we should send that off to signals. Yep. It's uh, clearly a question that applies citywide. Yeah. And uh, at least I would observe that that seems to be not the direction that we're heading, but I think uh, signals would be uh, certainly in a good position to explain why. Absolutely. We can do that. Uh, Maya Adamson's, why are the lanes on Scott not reduced starting at Churchill? Campbell, did you want to speak to that? I believe it's um, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, in, in effect, between uh, Churchill and um, I guess Smurl or coming up to, to Holland, um, we, we've already got only a single through lane in each direction. So there's not much to remove in the first case, in the first place. And when we do have a third lane, um, it's, it's used as an auxiliary turn lane uh, to ensure that turning vehicles aren't prohibiting through movement. Um, in the case of the, you know, while we're running the bus detour for the LRT construction, uh, we would not be looking at reducing lanes further at this time just so that we're able to operate a reliable transit service while we're in with mixed traffic. All right, thank you, Campbell. Um, Wellington West BIA once again uh, mentioning the Hinton Bridge Connections building, several ground floor commercial units, and we will strongly advocate for commercial units at grade as well as second floor office space commercial wherever possible. Uh, Marco joined late. Uh, yes, Marco, there are plans that you can see. We will have them on our blog tomorrow. Um, Mississippi Ward.ca, and they will be on the city's website uh, once translation is complete. Elaine McGregor says the most dangerous intersection in this corridor is Parkdale Scott. There have been several fatal, near fatal left turn collisions there. How are you addressing this danger? Also, with the reduction in lanes on Scott at this location, will there be enough space for OC Transpo routes 14 and 53 to turn left to get to Tunney's? There better be. <laughs> yes, we have been working closely with OC Transpo um, to make sure that. Uh, our configuration does accommodate uh, their buses. And so, yes, absolutely. Um, OC Transpo bus routes will continue to operate. And um, we, we have maintained the transit signal priority that, um, that they're putting in place at Parkdale, again, to keep reliable local bus service. Um, in terms of the Parkdale and Scott intersection, uh, it is one of the locations that we are building a protected intersection. And as, as Latko mentioned, 
this is uh, kind of a leading best practice that we uh, expect will make it safer for all users. All right, thank you. Um, okay, so we're, uh, Sherry says, turning left west onto Scott from North Valley Island Park currently requires running the red during busy times because there's no brake in southbound traffic. Are you saying you condone this driving behavior with your plan? Okay. Um, so Heather Mitchell again, uh, was wondering why there why there will be no public realm spaces between Churchill and Holland. Why is that? Um, so this is similar what uh, Campbell was um, saying about that it, it is already only one lane in each direction with turn lanes, um, and so the reason that we get those public realm spaces is because we're reducing vehicle lanes in the uh, easternmost segment. So it's really the function of kind of the, the width of the roadway relative to the how many lanes are needed. Right, okay. Does that answer the question, Heather? And you're welcome, you, you can send me a, an email uh, if you have further questions about that, happy to discuss. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so Dave Robertson says he agrees with me about uh, what I said about the PXOs uh, before, and how do we safely get people across Scott instead of prioritizing cars? Um, I, I mean, would, the, the I would intersection that, will help. I would uh, comment, uh, Tom, that if uh, there's a, a major uh, section of Scott between signalized intersections and a PXO is not feasible, then we can consider uh, what's called an IPS or a mid-block signal just for pedestrians to cross. And there's a, a process to evaluate when those are, as we say, warranted. And so I, I think, Tom, that's a process you're probably familiar with. And that, you know, that could be something that technically will work. Right. Uh, assuming the other uh, elements are, are covered off. Okay, thank you. Um, Mark B, Scott Street is a major cycling commuting route and many commuters are experienced and speedy riders. Did I know correctly there will be a 25 kilometer per hour speed limit on new cycling facilities, um, both on the north and south side? Well, I think uh, what's uh, uh, meant was uh, on the, uh, well, north and south side being eastbound, westbound, certainly on the on-road cycling lanes, there will not be a speed limit. On the shared uh, facility, which is split between pedestrians and cyclists, it's a good question. I, I, I don't want to make an answer right off the bat, but we should clarify that. And in, in general terms, uh, we should not have the, um, uh, it'll, it, it probably won't be the guidance we have today on a multi-use pathway, which is shared. So we'll, uh, we'll just make sure we clarify that. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, uh, Bill is wondering, will the east-west cycling and walking paths join the Sir John A. Macdonald Parkway? So I think the easy answer to that question is yes. Um, they, they will, during the uh, period of the, the bus detour, like I mentioned earlier, we are going to have a, a multi-use pathway along the south side of the uh, of that um, extension to Scott Street. And as you proceed west, I, I mentioned the uh, that bus only roadway will cross over to the north side of the transitway trench. Uh, however, at that point at Roosevelt, the pathway will continue to the west to meet up with the Sir John and McDonald Parkway. So that's how it will operate uh, while the bus detour is active. And then there are other plans uh, with stage two for how the connectivity will be uh, secured and maintained following revenue service of the LRT. Excellent, thank you. Okay, um, so um, I see another question from Marco. And Marco, we will have the plans up on our blog. And, uh, and 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 uh, if you have any further questions on that, by all means, contact our office, and and we can take it from there. Um, and then uh, Lori from Mechanicsville Community Association has a contact uh, for the gardener. 
along the Mump at Hinchy and Scott, and is also interested in more community gardens and benches uh, for seniors to sit on. So Lori, by all means, uh, connect us and uh, we'll see what we can do there. I think that is it. There were a lot of questions. I hope I got them all. Um, I what I what I will do is if for some reason I missed a question, um, please uh, retype it now. Uh, and otherwise, um, I maybe I'll turn it over to uh, to Jeff for some uh, final comments. Uh, if there are no other questions. Which I don't believe I see anymore. Yeah, I, I just want to make sure that we've got everything. Was the question, uh, and sorry, I just had to use washroom. Was the question no. about the 25 uh, hour, kilometer per hour speed limit asked um, as, a, as a cycling limit? Yes, it was asked, yes. Okay, you know what? I'll trust that you asked everything that's in the box. Um, so we'll just give it a, a minute or two. There was one from Loretta about fumes and quality of life. I don't know if that one got read out. So I assume she's talking about the bus detour. It's yeah, it's it's uh, a yo. Yeah, oh yes, I see that now about the yeah. uh, about the Tega building. Yeah. So the um, uh, it's interesting. I, I do have the experience of the stage one detour. Um, before I was elected, I was one of those folks out there with the no twenty five hundred buses a day um, uh, placards uh, pulling the stunts. Um, the fumes. I did pay. Uh, out of my office budget uh, for uh, environmental monitoring. Um, and the engineers uh, who have suggested that this is, um, uh, it does not pose a, a, an environmental risk, they, they are right. They know what they're talking about. Um, so the, you know, there'll be a heightened number of fumes, uh, but uh, it's, it's, it's within an acceptable limit uh, for a project like this. And quality of life, um, we will try to mitigate as much as possible um, the, you know, the noise and, 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 and other issues. The experience we had of the stage one detour, which was, you know, the same thing, all the buses went on Scott was that by and large, the traffic engineers actually knew what they were talking about. Uh, they are able to stage the buses in such a way that you don't have long lines of idling buses. They keep those moving through the corridor. And um, I remember before I got elected, there was a, I think it was a bomb threat at Tom Brown. Or maybe it might have been an accident, and there was this huge long line of buses, and I filmed that, and I said, "This is what it's going to look like when we have the uh, when we have the bus detour." Well, as it turns out, I was wrong. I've eaten a lot of crow on that. Um, it was nowhere near as impactful as. Um, uh, as we thought it might be. And, uh, you know, I think for the duration of this detour, uh, residents, um, they're going to, uh, we're asking a lot of them, uh, but I think they will get through it. And then uh, the reinstatement of that property will be uh, kind of interesting when everything gets done. So Loretta, I, I'm more than happy to chat with you more one-on-one -on -one about the concerns that you have. Uh, this has been a discussion that we've been having in the community for a good four years now. And, uh, and you know, it's, it's at the point where the project is moving ahead. Well, I do see, yes, we were going to get back to Klaus's question about the recess to parking bays uh, in Campbell. Uh, how will the cycling track get around it? And during the detour condition, uh, we've confirmed that those park there those parking bays will not be uh, there will be no parking bays, and so it'll be a um, mix of the on street pin curb separated bike lane and then the the ray cycle track, and then in the ultimate um, the ray cycle track generally goes behind the parking bays. We also had um, a clarification about the question about the sidewalk. Um, in front of Adams moving during the 2021 construction. Um, we aren't able to add a sidewalk in front of Adams moving, but in the um, like the ultimate um, reinstatement, once the transitway detour is over, uh, it does look like um, a sidewalk is already part of the plans in that location at that time. Was uh, Jen Stelter's question uh, answered with respect to uh, additional lighting? Yes. Okay. 
yeah, it's it's something we'll take to the lighting staff and, and a, sort of a case by case basis, specific locations. Uh, Klaus is asking for those recessed parking bays. How yeah. the uh, second? Okay. Yeah, we just did so, that one. Yeah, I think we're I think we're good. Uh, Sherry is asking why there's no consideration to the problem she's asked about. Give me a second here, Sherry. We'll just see. Oh, is that the dedicated left-hand turns from Island Park onto Scott? Is that correct? Oh, you know what that was asked. To, yep. Um, yeah. So, Sherry, um, I, uh, if you if you can drop my office a line, we'll make sure that the the right person um, is is looped in to answer the question. Um, clearly, a lot of uh, a lot of questions about the the intersection and the lights and everything. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, let's let's take that off and um, uh, have a good one on one discussion. And I would urge everybody who is coming out of tonight's um, open house with uh, further questions to drop us a line. I'm jeff.leapert, ottawa.ca. Um, uh, please, you know, feel free to follow up, offer further comment. Um, you know, this is a, a first look for everybody and, and not, you know, everything is not going to um, uh, come to light immediately. Um, sorry, uh, Randy's question on Carlton Avenue is a connection between Champlain Park as a as a protected intersection. Uh, so Randy is asking Carlton is an important connection between Champlain Park and the businesses on Wellington. Is there a reason it's not a protected intersection? Very fair question, Randy. Would you uh, like me to speak to that, Councillor? Yeah, please. Thanks. So uh, effectively, when we were um, scoping out the Stage Two LRT project there were four inter or three existing signalized intersections plus the fourth one at Churchill and Scott where we knew we were going to have to do work. And so those were the intersections where we took the opportunity to add the scope and bring the, uh, the intersections up to that new protected intersection standard. At Carleton, however, there was no need perceived at the time of scoping the project to, um, to make any changes. And so in, in an effort to, um, you know, I, I guess keep the LRT budget on track, um, we did not add that scope in at, at the time. So that's why there's no plans associated with the LRT project to make Carlton and Scott protected. Okay. I might bug you some more about that one. Figured as much. Yeah. Um, so with that, I mean, I will just say uh, thank you very much to Campbell and to Patrick and Mark and Zlatko and Deb uh, for the presentation. Uh, I will make this available as soon as I can. I do put out a weekly email newsletter, usually on the weekend, uh, which you can sign up for at kitchissippiward.ca. And when I have things that I'm able to share with the community, I rely on that as, uh, as the way to get word out. Um, and other than that, you know, please feel free to contact uh, Tom or I if you have any questions coming out of uh, tonight's session and uh, I will just say thank you very much everyone I'm uh, uh, curious to hear uh, curious to hear what you think over the coming days and weeks and have a good night Tom thank you very much thank you good night everybody good night everybody